morning. I thought to wake everyone up, we'd start with a kahoot, because um, it's a bit too early to jump into it normally. So, see if I can get this to work. All right. definitely recommend knowing the Centaur criteria pretty well. Um, do we know what they are? Obviously one of them is having swollen lymph nodes. The other one is you have to have a temperature of above 38 degrees. Um, your tonsils have to be enlarged or have exudate on them. Um, so you can get a red pharynx in just a viral infection um, and not having a cough. So there's also age limits, but I think if you know those four things, I used to go to boxing last year with my GP and he would make me say it in between boxing. So he'd be like, give me 10 punches. And then he'd be like, what are the four things in the centaur criteria? So I know it really well. Um, and if I got them wrong, he'd hit me in the face. <laughs> So this
this one was a bit of a trick question. Um, penicillin V, not penicillin 5, as I thought it was for like half of last year, and phenoxymethyl penicillin are the same thing, uh, just different names. And does anyone know why you don't give amoxicillin for strep throat? Yeah, so if you got it wrong and it's um, Epstein-Barr virus, you get covered in this really nasty rash. Um, so use this, and you'll see it written as both things on Monash exams, so just know that they're the same thing. I've got a slide in my presentation, but if they don't have red flags and it's a child with uh, acute otitis media, you don't give antibiotics, you just give them Panadol and reassurance. There are some situations where you would give amoxicillin if they were Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander or if they had hearing problems already and um, stuff like that, or if they have um, other really bad symptoms, so if they're vomiting um, and really unwell, you can give them amoxicillin, but normally it's go home, have Panadol. If they're still unwell in 48 hours, come back and then we'll maybe think about starting antibiotics. There's a picture. <laughs> So you probably get that one by process of elimination. I couldn't think of anything else that it could be. Um, cholesteatoma, pretty random, but it's something that comes up on exams and I think you just need to be able to pick it up from a spot diagnosis in a picture. They love in the GP exams to have <coughs> coloured photos of looking in either ears or eyes and you need to be able to recognise what these things are. Um, another photo coming. acute otitis media, you'd expect it to be red as well as kind of bulging and full of fluid. Um, so glue ear is when you, it's normally a complication of acute otitis media and you have a fusion without current infection. So it's not sore, but they have lots of fluid in behind their tymp tympanic membrane and um, it kind of, I always think it looks blue, so I kind of think of like blue ear, glue ear. Um, but yeah, know that one as well. questions like this I've seen on previous exams um, that are kind of, they give you something like this and you have to figure out what it is and you don't have to know a lot about all the conditions, it's more being able to think through it in your mind. So gentamicin toxicity, you'd think, you don't have to know what kind of hearing loss it is but it would most likely be bilateral. Uh, a foreign body is going to be one but that's going to be conductive. Occupational probably going to be bilateral too unless you always stood with like one ear next to a speaker. Um, and acoustic neuroma um, can cause unilateral sensory neural hearing loss. Um, and anytime someone has this, it's an acoustic neuroma until proven otherwise. So if someone comes in and they've lost hearing in one ear and you think it's sensory neural, you have to suspect uh, acoustic neuroma until you can prove that it's not. <laughs> 
have audiograms because we had one last year in our OSCE so maybe they won't give it to you um, but the, the trick with knowing the noise induced one is it gives you that tick pattern oh can I yeah um, so because it comes down here it means that at whatever this four means that's the level of noise that they're exposed to well that was the noise that caused it so they lose just that frequency of being able to hear. Um, so if it's the tick shape, it's noise induced. It's a bit funny, the wording of Rinnies, Renee's. I don't know, I say Renee's. Um, so that's the test when you put the fork here and then you say, can you hear it? And when they say they can't anymore, you then bring it here. And so this is bone conduction. That's air conduction there. So it's normal if they say, no, I can't hear it anymore. And you say, can you hear it here? And they say, yes. Um, so that means the air conductor is normal, is greater than bone conduction. Um, and that's normal, and a normal test means Renee's positive. Um, there's no negative or positive for Weber's, it's just you put it here and then they localise to a side. needles the bigger the number it means the smaller they are um, and you want to use the smaller ones for hearing because the big one I don't think would be very sensitive this 128 one is the one that you'd use in your neuro exam on like lower limbs to see if people can feel vibration um, but in Tally and O'Connor it says you can use either of those so just know which one you'd use I think when I was a year a one of our OSCE stations they had, it was an ear exam and they have all the tuning forks lined up and you had to pick which one you were going to use, so worthwhile knowing. <laughs> Um, so Epley's manoeuvre is the treatment for benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. Um, you diagnose it using the Dix Hall Park manoeuvre, so that's one where you kind of lean back and you make their eyes go crazy. Um, and then this is, it's similar, but it's what you use to kind of treat it. Um, and we'll go over that in the slides as well. All right, two to go. <laughs> It's not a stroke. Forehead sparing. So this is a pretty good picture of it, really, that he has crinkles on this side but not on that side. Um, so if it's not forehead sparing, um, yeah, it means it's lower motor neuron. Um, and so that means it's more likely to be a Bell's palsy than a stroke. But you should always kind of make sure it's not a stroke. You wouldn't want to miss that in someone. 
So, do you know when you would use antivirals in an, a Bell's palsy? Yeah, in Ramsey Hunt syndrome. Um, but otherwise, there's no role for antivirals. It's, I don't think it's always caused by a viral. It's just inflammation of the facial nerve. Um, and it's important to not forget um, eye drops and an eye patch in people because um, they can't close their eyes. So, that's really it kind of resolves on itself. But steroids can kind of speed that process up. Um, so, well done to this person. Um, <laughs> right, where have I put my presentation? <laughs> cool. All right, so just letting everyone know that I'm still a medical student. I'm no um, ENT expert at all. I pretty much just knew buzzwords and picture associations to get through my exams and I'm standing here now as no longer a fourth year so I think that if I can do it everyone can do it. Um, so I'm doing ENT, it's kind of a random topic I feel. Um, so this is an E <laughs> um, and just it's kind of important for some of the things to know what happens in the inner ear versus what happens in the middle of the ear and knowing like the borders of this um, and you should also know kind of what things are called so if you do get an ear exam you can actually say the words so I think that in any exam um, it's all about just getting as many words as you can blurt out in that space and kind of saying like this looks okay this looks okay this looks okay because it shows that you actually know what you're looking for um, definitely know how to do an ear exam I think it's a really likely thing that you'd get in your station that and an eye exam because they can it's fast enough that they can chuck it in with other things so they can be like do an ear exam and then manage them or whatever. Um, a lot of the other exams take longer so they don't have that and I think that in GP every year there's always at least one examination station. We had ear last year, the person had tinnitus, um, it was a pretty tricky station. Um, so just do your general, I just always do look, feel, move special tests. Um, so when you're doing your look the more things you can say, the more impressive you're going to look. Um, so don't forget to say things that aren't there. So always say, like, I'm looking for discharge. There's no, like, blood. There's no rashes. There's no things on the skin. There's not, like, heaps of wax. Feel so you can touch for temperature. Don't forget lymph nodes. Um, so you've got your pre-auricular ones and your post-auricular ones. You can always chuck in, like, cervical as well because ENT, everything's connected. So you can do, like, the whole thing if you want. Um, and then pulling this part of the ear, the pinna, because if they have an infection, that's often like sore. And then the whisper test, so that's the one where you put the hair here and you crinkle it. Say three, you have to say three numbers. One of them's supposed to end in like nine, and then one of them's supposed to not be, so you get high frequency and low frequency. Um, Renee's and Weber's, do people understand that? I think it's something you really need to know well because it can be a bit tricky. Um, I've got slides later, but it can come up in written exams as well where they'll say, like, this person had Renee's positive, Weber's was localising here, like, what kind of hearing loss do they have? Even though in the real world no one ever does it because it's a stupid test. Um, and then otoscope, know how to use them, practice on real patients like if when you're in your GP clinic I'd recommend just if someone every time someone comes in with a virus which is every second person just pretend you need to look in their ears you probably can anyway um, but yeah especially on kids because it can be a bit of a art um, but just look in as many ears as you can get to know what's normal figure out what's not normal and just know your way around the equipment so if you get a station you're not like I don't know how to turn this on so this is just straight from Tally and O'Connor um, you have to do Renee's test first and you do it in, I think, the ear that's not normal. So if they say, oh, I've got, like, I can't hear out of this ear, you put the tuning fork here and then you bang it, say, can you hear it? And they'll say, not anymore, and then you put it there. If that's 
negative, so you put it here and they say, no, I can't hear it, it's suggestive that they have a conductive hearing problem. And then if you put it here in the middle, it'll localise to the side that has the problem. And you can figure this out a little bit if you're sitting in an exam and you're like, I can't remember which one's which. If you cover your ear like this, that's kind of making yourself be conductively deaf in that ear, um, you'll notice that, I don't know, things seem louder here. So if you put something here, it's going to vibrate there and you're like, okay, that's happening here. So you can kind of figure it out with your own brain. Um, <laughs> these are just, I kind of started off thinking, I'm going to do this PowerPoint as like differentials and then go through it, but then I got over that. So this is the only time I did it. Um, know what these things are. You don't need to know management for these. Um, just kind of know that they exist and kind of know the words around if it was in an examination, in a question on a paper, what would be the things. So probably know what these two are. Um, TMJ, arthralgia is just like pain in your jaw from using, like it's this joint. Um, never forget referred pain. Norm loved to give questions about like the tonsils causing pain in the ear or like if you have dental pain so if you're doing an ear pain history like always ask like have you had teeth problems or like do you have any other symptoms at all. Eustachian tube dysfunction um, happens more like uh, more commonly in children when their tubes are like blocked up um, and it can cause pain when you get off an aeroplane and you like can't pop your ears that's what they're in all the time. Um, Ramsey Hunt syndrome, you get your facial droop and you have pain in your ear because you have shingles in your ear pretty much, so that would be painful. Um, a cholesteatoma is that gross thing that we looked at before and it's pretty much just like a sack of wax and skin. So it's kind of like <laughs> something happens, you can get them after you perforate your eardrum and then the eardrum kind of like invaginates on itself and like collects all this skin and wax and it's like this gross thing. Um, foreign body is probably going to hurt, and then trauma, so they're good things to know about when you're thinking about a history, and you'll see them pop up on um, examination questions. Um, so acute otitis media is definitely something I'd know back to front. Uh, very likely that you could get this at an OSCE station. You need to know the management as well as what it presents like. Um, so basically it's your middle ear um, inflammation and it's normally sudden onset. Um, if it's discharging, it means that the eardrum has perforated and you can also get fever and if they're really unwell, they can be vomiting. It normally happens in kids. Um, one of the risk factors, so you'll look more impressive if you ask, is anyone smoking in the household? Um, and also if you're Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander, they're more likely to get it and also more likely to need antibiotics um, so they don't get rheumatic fever. Um, yeah, it can be viral or bacterial or both. Um, and on the examination, so you can't, having, as I said before, red ear like drums doesn't mean that they have acute otitis media. You actually have to have like bulging and fluid in there and it'll look really inflamed, not just a bit red. If it's just red, it's more likely to be kind of like a viral, like fluy virus thing. Um, it's normally a clinical diagnosis, so you should be able to pick it up in the clinic. And the management is, if it's a healthy kid, just send them home with Panadol. If it's really bad, you can give them uh, ear drops that are just lignocaine. Um, and as I said before, there's only a couple of times that you'd give oral antibiotics straight up, and that's if they're really sick or if they're Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander or they've already lost hearing in one of their ears and, like, you really need to protect that ear. Um, if they get it all the time, which some kids do, um, and this could be something they ask in an OSCE station, the mum might be like, oh, they get it all the time, can't they just go on antibiotics? And the answer is no. Um, but they might need to get grommets or... Um, yeah, if they're swimming all the time, ear putty and things can help. So these are the three pictures. I would know, like, what each means. This is just a normal eardrum, so that should be nothing wrong with that. This is someone with a virus, so it's red. You can see, like, the tympanic membrane is still clear. You can see through it. This, like, I think this is the cone of light people talk about. I don't really know what I'm looking for, but 
it seems like it might be it. Um, and this is someone with acute otitis media, so it's all bulgy, it's cloudy behind there, and it's red. This is straight from the Royal Children's Hospital guidelines. Um, definitely recommend looking at that. It's a really good kind of comprehensive thing for acute otitis media, and it, like kids get it. I don't think adults get it that often. Um, so you go through this, and as it says here, amoxicillin for five days if they have red flags. Uh, some of the complications, um, which again might be a good thing to talk about if there's an OSCE station, they might say like, oh, what if it doesn't get better? What bad things could happen? Um, so perforation isn't really that bad. Like if it perforates, often it relieves the pain and it just grows back in its own time, one of the things that can happen is they get that cholesteatoma that I spoke about before. Um, but if they perforate it, it doesn't actually change the management. So if they come back and they say, oh, I perforated my eardrum, do I need antibiotics now? The answer is no. Um, acute mastoiditis is bad, that's what this is. And so it's when the infection gets into the mastoid and then bad, they need surgery probably. Um, glue ear, so that's, you can get it. If you get recurrent otitis media, you get buildup of fluid but it's not infected anymore. And the problem is that um, it, you lose your hearing in that ear for a while. And so if children have this a lot, and it happens a lot in um, Aboriginal populations, unfortunately, is that they can't hear properly, and so they don't learn properly, and then they have like speech and language slowed development because of this. So that's why it needs treating. Um, it fixes itself a lot of the time though, um, so it's more you just need to get them back if they have it to have a look, and if it's not gone in three months, they need referral to ENT and it'll be a surgical fixing of that. Um, you can get a facial nerve palsy, meningitis, but that's super rare, and an abscess, which is also pretty rare. Um, some people just have chronic ear infections too, which this is the definition, it has to be at least six weeks. Um, and yet, yeah, it's when you get a perforation that can cause it. Um, and again, kind of same complications. And the management is just keeping it clear, um, clean and dry all the time. So making sure you dry it well after a shower. You can get ciprofloxin eardrops. Um, and if they do have a perforation, you can give them oral antibiotics in that case. But I, know, I don't think you'd get really asked much about that. This is, I think I've explained all about this now. Um, it can also have the tympanic membrane. So this is, there's no tympanic membrane there because it's all like in there. Um, you can have a tympanic, tympanic membrane too, and that's when it's more of a congenital cause, um, but pretty <coughs> rare and I don't think that'll come up. <clears throat> um, so otitis externa is also known as swimmer's ear because swimmers get it commonly. And that's just inflammation of the outside bit of the ear, not behind the membrane, in front of the membrane. Um, and it's often caused by swimming. Um, if you have a hearing aid or skin problems, they, people get it. And it can be bacterial, fungal, inflammatory. Um, again, keep it dry. And you can get an antibiotic and steroid drop. Um, but yeah, I think that's pretty straightforward. <coughs> Um, so if you get a hearing loss or deafness station, we got it last year, so I don't know if that means you won't get it, um, but still know it. Um, <clears throat> the history, hopefully they can hear you to take the history. Um, but some things to just, I don't know, it's a bit unlike most of your other histories, figure out where is the hearing loss, is it bilateral or unilateral, and then figure out if it's conductive or sensorineural, probably need to do an exam to figure that out. Um, and then things that it's associated with as well as all like their occupational history and all of that. So do they have tinnitus, which is that ringing in the ear? Um, is, do they have pain? Do they have symptoms of stroke? So kind of go through some neuro questions. You have tingling, numbness, weakness, um, vertigo, <coughs> or like viral symptoms. <coughs> um, audiogram. So presbycusis. I don't know if it's presbycusis or presbycusis, um, is just age-related normal hearing loss. So you need to know how to recognise this audiogram um, because this would be a good exam question. And so this is when the drop-off goes kind of like in a slope. 
So people lose the higher frequency first, and these people will, you can, it's a good question to ask in a station is, do you have more trouble hearing women's voices or men's voices? And because women have ho higher voices normally, um, they can say like, oh yeah, I can never hear when my wife speaks to me. Um, <laughs> so yeah, remember that drop off, the slow one is presbycusis, as opposed to noise induced, where it's at a certain level. And that's because that's the noise frequency that they're always exposed to, so their hair, hair cells die there and they can't do it anymore. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Um, yeah, and this is all, I don't think this part is particularly, like it's just a left ear, right ear. You can figure it out if you do have to explain one. It's all there on the graph and you can kind of just ramble your way through it and be like, oh, so you can see here your right ear is doing this and the left ear is doing this. And this is just one where they're different. So this is unilateral. Um, and the right ear is obviously not as good as the left ear, so there's another cause for that. I don't know what it is, could be anything. Um, Bell's palsy, I think is very examinable, both from OSCE and exam point of view. Um, so it's inflammation of the facial nerve. I love Bell's palsy because one of the first patients I ever saw when I was a year A had Bell's palsy. And she had this classic presentation where she said, oh, um, I was making dinner and I made this like really good bolognese and I put so much stock cubes in it and then when I ate it I thought, oh, it doesn't have enough salt, like it's flavourless. And then I went to go to bed and like my face looked weird so I thought I was having a stroke so I called up the, uh, the ambulance. And so if you know what the facial nerve does, one of the functions is taste in, on the tongue. Um, and another one is you get this hyperacusis, which is where things sound really loud in one ear because your nerve to stapedius um, is controlled by the facial nerve. So if you don't have that, um, and the stapedius kind of like stops the tympanic membrane vibrating, I think. So if you don't have that, it just keeps going and things sound really loud. So that's another like tricky one. But the most obvious thing is normally the facial uh, droop which is the whole side of the face because it's a lower motor neuron problem. Um, the management, once you've decided it's definitely not a stroke, um, you can give steroids to reduce the inflammation, eye patch, eye drops, etc. cetera. Um, and then Ramsey-Hunt syndrome, definitely know about it. Um, it's when you get the shingles in your, it comes in the ear. So anytime someone has a Bell's palsy, if you got it as a station, you need to look in their ear. Um, because these people are a lot more sick and they definitely need antivirals. All right, pharyngitis. Um, I think this is a great OSCE station because there's so much counselling and GP, they love you to do counselling. We got anti, you know, we had it like an anti-vax, it wasn't an anti-vaxxer, but it was a vaccination station last year. So I think it would be really likely that you guys could get like a antibiotic resistance kind of, because GP are all about that. Um, so you could, it could be a kid or it could be an adult coming in with a sore throat wanting antibiotics. And I think it would be really cool if you'd be like, no, you can't have them and these are all the reasons why. Um, so if someone does have pharyngitis, <coughs> you can either just... <coughs> sorry, maybe I have pharyngitis. Um, <coughs> um, you can swab them. So there's a thing called a rapid strep test, which like, it's, I think it's a PCR or something. It's just a quick kind of tells you if they've got strep or not. Um, if your patient was an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander, the management, again, is different because of their risk of rheumatic fever um, and because they don't get antibiotics enough for pharyngitis, um, you'd more likely give antibiotics to that population. Um, but, yeah, these is the centaur criteria here. So... This is something I just made up when I was looking at it, being like, how can I make everyone remember it? TTLC, I don't know. Um, tonsils, temperature, lymph nodes, and cough absence. So if they have those four things, it's more likely to be bacterial, and then you can think about antibiotics, but especially if they have their chorizal symptoms, so they're like, oh, I've got this really sore throat, I think I've got tonsillitis, but I've got a runny nose, and like a low-grade fever, they don't have tonsillitis. <clears throat> so this is the centaur criteria in picture format. And so you can see here 
this would be like your highest risk person is a young person who has exudate on their tonsils and swollen lymph nodes, high temperature and no cough and they still only have a 50% likelihood of actually having strep causing it. Um, so tonsillitis, this is what it looks like. They get this really like gross exudate and the tonsils are quite enlarged. It's not just a red throat. Um, so treat with phenoxymethyl penicillin or penicillin V. Um, if it's really big like this and they can't breathe properly, you can also give them steroids. So I've seen people be given like um, injections of dexamethasone. Um, another good thing that they could put in this station, I think, is then like the parent being like, oh, can't they just get their tonsils out? Um, and the answer is probably no. Um, so they used to just take everyone's tonsils out, but then they realised the surgery is actually quite a dangerous one. Um, and the risk of bleeding is pretty high and can be all the way up to 10 days after. So it's not something you just want to do for the sake of it. So this is the paradise criteria here. You have to have at least seven episodes in a year or five in the two years or three in all of the three years. So it's like a lot of episodes of tonsillitis. It's not just someone who's come in and they're like, oh, I had tonsillitis twice, can I have my tonsils out? Um, and it has to be like a proven actual tonsillitis. <clears throat> I need some water. Um, so peritonsillar abscesses, also known as Quincy, is one of the bad complications of tonsillitis and it's when you just get like a build up of pus and stuff in the back of your throat. Um, it's kind of like an abscess I guess. Um, it's usually caused by group A strep um, and the, the main symptom that would give this away is that people can't open their mouth. Like if you say, look, I want to look in your mouth, they can only go, and go like this because it hurts so much. Um, and someone told me this year that the definition of trismus, which is like not being able to open your mouth, is three fingers. So a normal person should be able to open their mouth to three fingers of their eyes. So if they can't do three of their own fingers, that counts as trismus. Um, the management is like a pretty bad one, so <laughs> they probably need to go to hospital. Um, you can give IV antibiotics. That should say Ben Pen, not Pen Pen. Um, obviously, because this person's not going to be able to really swallow tablets, so they definitely need IV, um, and it needs either drainage, which you can you can watch videos on YouTube. They're so gross, but awesome. You get like a needle and you suck out all the pus, or you can do like an excision and drainage. And this person can have a tonsillectomy afterwards. So if you get that, you probably well, there's an increased risk that you'll get it again. So you can send them off to an ENT surgeon to then get their tonsils out. Um, epiglottitis, it's more of a peds condition, but a really important one, so I put it in here too. And this is a, a child who has stridor, so they're doing that inspiratory wheeze. Um, and they will be, they can't close their mouth, so the opposite of not being able to open it. And there's normally drooling, and they're like sitting forward like this, and they can't like straighten their neck. Um, and in the stem. I don't think this would ever be an OSCE, but it's a classic um, MCQ question. They're usually from like Afghanistan in the question will be like this, like Afghanistan child. Um, and that means if they're from a country, another country, it means they're not vaccinated, apparently. Um, so this is an emergency, probably not a GP thing. I don't think they'd be that nasty, but put it in here anyway. Um, but if it did happen in the GP, you call the ambulance, you get your most senior anaesthetist ready to intubate them. Um, don't touch them, don't examine them because you're going to make things worse and they need IV keftriaxone and steroids once they're intubated or before if you want. Um, and diphtheria, another one that happens in people who aren't vaccinated and you get this, it's called a pseudomembrane, it's super gross um, and that's pretty bad too. But yeah, just another kind of one to watch out for. Um, Epstein-Barr virus, I like this because I had it. Um, also known as the kissing disease or glandular fever or in America they call it mono. Um, the kind of classic presentation, so this comes up in, in MCQ questions all the time. It's like this person had tonsillitis and then you gave them this and they got the rash even though we got told you weren't supposed to give them this. Um, yeah, so you probably all know what it is. There's two tests that you need to know about. 
So the heterophile antibody test, which is also known the mono spot test, they're both buzzwords, remember them for EBV. Um, Monash probably still use those words even though now we use EBV serology instead, it's much more um, sensitive and specific. Um, but if you see this, it means think about EBV. The management, I think again this would be a really good OSCE station because there's a lot of kind of counselling involved. Um, so antibiotics aren't going to help because it's a virus. Uh, you get an enlarged spleen. So you're not allowed to play contact sports for a month because you can get a splenic rupture afterwards. Um, just go easy on the alcohol because it can also kind of give you liver problems. I couldn't actually find that anywhere, but that's what I got told when I went home after I had it. They were like, oh, your LFTs are deranged, so don't go too hard on the alcohol. So I don't know, I trusted that doctor. Um, and like... I don't know if this would actually happen, but you could mention it's transferred from saliva to saliva, so you get it from kissing someone else who has it. Um, so you could kind of mention that. But I think that by the time you're 18, 90% of the population already have the virus, and it's one of those things that if you do get sick, it's because you kind of run down at the time that you're exposed to it, and it kind of gets the better of you. Um, you can also give steroids if their tonsils are like this and they can't breathe. Um, esophageal cancer... Kind of, I've seen it in an OSCE station before where it was very, like, non-specific. This person was just like, oh, you know, like, my voice is a bit weird and it hurts to swallow and then they'd lost all this weight and they were tired. Um, and, the, like, there wasn't much to do in this station except you had to recognise that this person had red flags and refer them for an urgent scope. So just keep in the back of your mind that even though you're in GP... Um, things can be kind of emergencies and need referral. Um, um, so I just took this slide directly from Anthony's lecture from last year. Um, I started watching it because I was like, oh, I don't want to miss things. And then I realised he does a really, really, really good job of the management of everything, much more in depth than I've gone into. Uh, so I'd recommend watching that as well. Um, hopefully I've given you like a baseline understanding of some things and then he can give you a bit more depth. Um, but I took that this straight from here because it was so good that I was like, I can't do better than this, I'm just going to copy it. Um, so these four things you definitely need to know just enough about. Benign, BPPV, I think you could get in an OSCE station, so know like the management, but these ones you just need to be aware of what they are and know how to pick them out of an MCQ. So... Um, I'll come back to this to BPPV because I've got a whole slide on it. But many airs disease is it sucks. I don't want to have it. Um, but basically, what happens is in the like your semicircular canals, which are the things in your ear, um, you have a problem with fluid homeostasis and they're always too full of fluid um, and so they're like permanently basically dizzy, they get vertigo all the time, they can have hearing problems as well um, and the kind of classic example is um, I'm pretty sure like I've diagnosed myself but in Arrested Development, uh, Lucille 2 I don't know if anyone's seen it, the lady that always is like passing out from vertigo Pretty sure she has this, <laughs> but it's when people have ongoing vertigo, vertigo and they can just be like standing and they're like, oh no, I'm going to fall, and then they just fall. Um, this is inflammation of the vestibular nerve, which is eighth cranial nerve, um, and it's normally like a short term thing where people get like hearing problems and kind of dizziness at once. So it's more of an acute kind of associated with a virus and an acoustic neuroma is when you have um, well a neuroma so it's kind of like a cancer of that part of your it is really complicated, I don't know that much about it I probably shouldn't be doing this lecture <laughs> um, but they get dizziness that's ongoing and they get uh, progressive hearing loss, which is sensorineural. So as I said before, anytime someone has a uni, it's going to be one-sided as well. It can be two-sided. If it's in both sides, it's a congenital thing. It's associated with neurofibromatosis too. Um, that's like buzzword there, more of a peds question though. Um, 
Yeah, so talk about benign processes. This is the hardest thing to say ever. Benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. So this, the classic like person who has this is they say like every morning when I get up like I get really dizzy and you have to figure out if it's when they're standing they get dizzy or is it when they're moving their head because people that get out of bed and stand up and get dizzy that's more orthostatic hypertension making them dizzy usually um, whereas BPV is like they roll over and the change of position in their head makes them dizzy. Um, I think it's a really good one to know how to explain as well so you have like your three semicircular canals in your ear and what happens in these people is they have like a little something like a little thing floating around that gets stuck and it messes up the normal balance sense in your ear um, and so when you move your ear doesn't like correct your balance correctly because of this blockage in there um, and you get really dizzy it's important to be able to know what vertigo is as well and just um, know that it's not just normal dizziness or lightheadedness so vertigo the room is spinning normally so if someone says like oh, I'm dizzy you need to figure out are they having like room spinning sensations or are they feeling lightheaded because they're very different um, different things and they normally have different causes if it's vertigo it's an inner ear thing um, so you can watch these in your own time but know how to do the whole pike maneuver and I think know how to do the epley maneuver as well as well um, and that's the management normally for BPPV and people will love you <laughs> because you can fix like they come in and they're like oh I get this like terrible dizziness it's so bad blah 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 and you like lie them on the bed and you just move their head for them and they're like oh my gosh I'm fixed like you have magic hands um, I've seen it happen once so it was pretty cool um, but yeah you can also send them to a physio for that um, so if you did have to manage them and you can give them anti um, emetics in the short term if they're getting problems but yeah remember allied health in GP that you can always send people off um, yeah many years I think I spoke about this already but there's too much fluid in there and it just messes up everything um, you can also have many years syndrome which is when you don't have the disease but you're getting the symptoms of it which is the vertigo and the tinnitus and the dizziness and hearing changes as well um, but that's another cause not caused by many years disease um, so yeah as I said before watch Anthony's lecture from last year they're on the Moomus YouTube page um, probably watch all of last year's really vision lectures because I think they're a great way to learn and kind of make sure that you haven't missed out on anything um, and hearing the same thing from two people from different perspective is probably going to be useful um, and he's got a picture quiz at the end of his as well which is really useful because as I said before ENT you're most likely going to get at least one photo of an ear and need to know what's wrong with it um, practice your examinations a lot because it's easy marks and the more that you do it the better you're going to be um, and know things so I would say acute otitis media pharyngitis and benign paroxysmal positional vertigo and Bell's palsy as well would be four things in um, ENT that are all like completely fair OSCEs for you to have to do so no management um, and just some general advice for fourth year you guys are halfway through now so you're probably pretty flat um, so just like do things at your own pace I found it really frustrating last year where people would always try and compare themselves to you or you'd compare yourself to other people so if you don't feel like studying with your friends one night don't do it like have nights off when you need it um, figure out what your priorities are and actually stick by them and it's okay to say no so if you have non-medical friends or friends not in fourth year who want you to go out with them on the weekend and you're stressed just say no I was bad at that but I can look back um, do things in groups like I think that the more you're speaking about things and having other people speak about them to you is the best way to learn there's so much content for this year you're not going to learn it by yourself sitting at your computer um, don't spend heaps of time looking for answers from past exams and cami papers because if it's a contentious question 
chances are it got deleted anyway. Like, there's so many questions that last year I'd have hours and hours of discussions or like researching being like, what is the answer to this question? And then realise like it's just a stupid question. I'm sure they deleted it from the bank. Um, it won't come up again and the chances of it, it's not worth your time. I think a lot of people say, oh, GP's easy. I'm not going to study that as much. Like women's is way harder. I'm going to spend all my time there. Um, I wouldn't do that because it's, I don't know, it's easy to learn a lot of it well and I think it's harder than you originally think. Like you think, oh, like this is easy, but the amount of management that you need to know is a lot more than other um, disciplines. Um, I watched a lot of YouTube explanations. You can do it in bed before you go to sleep. Like listen to people explain it in lay terms because you kind of get better ideas of, I watched like just a vaccine video. Sometimes you forget when you're only speaking to medical people like how to explain things. I watched a vaccine video in SWATVAC last year because I was like, I can't, well, I can't really remember how vaccines work. And then it came up in our like OSCEs a week later and I basically like just recited what they said about like, your, vac your body is a warrior or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, don't stress out about the via because I am a firm believer that you genuinely cannot study for it. Uh, last year, people had like via study groups and they were going over all their bio came from the pre clin years and then our entire via was questions on like snake bite management and burns and because they got the, the questions from an external database. So don't think that you can like prepare for it. I think it's meant to be almost a general knowledge test. You're better off putting all of your time into knowing your 4C content and your 3B content really, really well because that's a big part of it anyway. And the other questions, it's genuinely luck. Like, I don't think that you can cover everything, so just learn what you know will be there. Um, and then expect the unexpected. You're going to get at least probably two OSCE stations that you come out and you're like, I have no idea what that was asking. They intentionally put really, really hard things that are obscure there to trick you um, and to figure out. There's kind of like, I don't know, 60% of the stations are meant to be pretty achievable so everyone can do them and then there's always a couple in there that are there just to kind of separate the top 10%. Um, so if you come, don't let it get you down when you're swapping. Um, but at the same time, I think it's worthwhile practicing OSCEs a lot because you're learning all of the content while you do it. Um, and some of the ways that I did it last year, so just having like an OSCE friend um, or OSCE friends, so having like a night where you get together and you say, all right, we'll do four each, do it in pairs, and then have multiple people you do that with because the more people that you're doing it with, the more kind of exposed you're going to be. You're going to have better ways of doing it. Um, another way that I did it last year was having just doing the reading time, so sitting in a group of people, putting a timer on for four minutes, having a station up, filling out your piece of paper, and then not actually doing the OSCE, but kind of saying, this is what I was going to do, this is what I wrote down, like this is my management, seeing what everyone else said. Um, I think that's a really efficient use of your time because by the end of the year, the eight minutes of actually explaining things, um, like you know how to speak to people, I think. Um, OSCE nights in the second semester last year, me and a group of people in Traralgon, we would all go to uni, I think it was Tuesday nights, and we'd all bring printed out some stations, put them down and in pairs we'd go around. And you do, we had timers set, I think we'd do like between 8 to 10 every Tuesday night in pairs with under the time pressure. And it just made it easy because you didn't have to convince yourself like, oh, I'm going to do it. It's just like, okay, Tuesday nights we do OSCEs. Um, and practice with someone who isn't medical, especially GP, and if you can make them understand what you're saying, um, I think you're doing a pretty good job. Um, so give that a go. And they sometimes like it. Um, they learn things. And yeah, that's the end. So... Thank you.